takes up to a second and a half for your eyes to see the threat be neutralized, get back to your brain, tell your brain to stop shooting. That's another second and a half. That's nine more shots. That's 18 shots that their witness justified Jason Van Dyke using. He didn't fire 18 shots. There's a lot more on here, Patrick. I'm sure you have notes on them. But I think we've identified the key points for him. Well, Yuri Patrick talks about things that indicate reasonable um, police officers that a threat may be happening. Okay? And this is important because if, if Laquan McDonald um, did not appear to be some kid whacked out on PCP, acting really bizarrely, if this was a kid in a, in a Boy Scout uniform, uh, just walking down the street with a knife, um, and Jason Bendek shot him, yeah, probably wouldn't be justified. But it's not. Your Patrick says, you've got to look for those signs. You're a police officer. They're witness. Your Patrick, you remember when I asked him about, well, he, he was a witness for the, for the state. Well, I said, well, in fact, you recently testified in a case where you found a police officer's actions were reasonable when an individual raised a stick and they were within eight to 10 feet of that police officer, when they raised it as they attacked the police officer, raised the stick, the shooting happened, eight to 10 feet away. That's good, but a knife? Not as dangerous as a stick. Signs of a disturbed individual, signs of a potential threat, we heard it from their witnesses. Somebody that doesn't make eye contact, somebody that doesn't um, respond to dozens and dozens of police commands, marked squad cars flying in every direction, somebody who's walking down the street not making eye contact, that's a sign of an imminent threat, testified by their witnesses. But how about when, remember we talked about this in opening, I said, think about a monster movie, excuse me. <clears throat> think about a monster movie. When they're walking down the street, and say there's, the, the victim is hiding in the bush, you know, there's not much danger here. But when that monster suddenly stops and turns and looks right at that, that victim in the bush, I, I think I said that's when the music starts to play. That's when, that's when the, the filmmakers are like, okay, I got him right now. Jason Van Dyke wasn't in the movie, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't the video game. This was real life. Gary Patrick still. No, no way of knowing what Jason Van Dyke was seeing, experience, or capturing. I haven't talked with them. It's important. Because the only way to fully, if you don't have video from somebody's perspective, yeah, you could have talked to Joe Walsh. He didn't talk to Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh would have said, this is what I saw. I would have shot the guy. He was a danger. They didn't. They didn't talk to Jason Van Dyke. Well, the state made a big point about how Jason Van Dyke spoke to um, to our witnesses. He spoke to Larry Miller. Uh, he spoke to Barry Brock. What's wrong with that? That's how you provide an in-depth analysis. That's how you get the context for the full two-hour movie, instead of showing the last two minutes. Your video states only evidence. That portion, that's not the same as seeing that in real life. Yes.
Dr. Miller, remember his testimony. Pretty hard to read. I'm try my best here. So the main difference is, for most of us, if, if we're faced with danger, our brains are telling us to do whatever you can to get away from the danger. If, you're, if your car is skidding off the road, correct it. If someone is chasing you, elude them. If the house is on fire, get out of it. First responders, police officers, their task is a little different. Because even though the brains are telling you to run, get away, save yourself, their job is exactly to do the opposite. They have to run towards the danger. Different than what an average civilian. The average civilian, like you and I, is heightened that danger, heightened that threat level. And therefore, the types of reaction that we see are probably a little more common. The threat level. The, the, the actions of Aquan McDonald on the ground. Um, Jason Van Dyke saw them a lot different than what was on that video. He saw it different for a number of reasons. One, because that video doesn't ca capture it properly. Now, all the other witnesses saw him moving. But does it show him about to get up? Does it show him you know, up to his knees and about to get up? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But you know, you know who it would look like that to? Somebody that just had to use his gun for the first time in his career, working in the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, that person, just seconds after he had to shoot somebody, the threat looked bigger, it looked closer. Does that mean Jason Van Dyke is a weak person? Does that mean that, that he has some uh, mental problems that prevent him from being a reasonable police officer? No. That's exactly how police officers in that situation would respond. State Mix talked about, well, Jason Van Dyke, um, he said, we're going to have to kill this guy. Um, somehow, that, that is a, uh, some negative connotation towards Jason Van Dyke. Some connotation that Jason Van Dyke uh, was going to shoot this guy because, as they say, Jason was angry that this guy was um, not listening to them. Do you see any evidence of that? Jason was angry at the young black boy. Remember that in opening? Do you see any evidence that race had anything to do with this case? When you don't have evidence, you use argument. When you go back there, you can't listen to the arguments. Put them out of your mind. The evidence came from this witness stand and were exhibits that Judge Gaughan entered into evidence. And you'll get those back. Reasonable. Is it reasonable for Jason Van Dyke to experience what he said he was experiencing? Well, he was in fear. Any reasonable police officer hearing that fellow officers are being attacked would be alert to a threat. That goes to his comment that he made to Joe Walsh. When Jason Van Dyke hears that, that police officers are attacked, that's a big deal. The state wants you to think, well, they just popped his tire. And um, he was just playing around. Nobody was afraid. Nobody was scared. Well, why didn't you call? Why didn't you call Mr. Gaffney in here to say, yeah, it was nothing, just a little misunderstanding? Why? Because Gaffney would have said, I was scared to death, just like any police officer in that no, situation no, 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 would have done. No, 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 And in fact, after Joe Walsh testified, you didn't hear from any of those other officers on the scene, right? Why not? It's Joe Walsh killed her case. Game over. Dr. O'Donnell, pharmacologist, interprets the results for Jason Van Dyke. Valporic acid and risperidone, antipsychotic medicine. 
Jason Van Dyke was, or I'm sorry, but Juan McDonald um, was prescribed those, had not been taking them that um, within the recent um, past of when he was killed. Significance of that? Yes, when coupled with PCP. Use PCP within a recently relative, uh, a relatively recent time period. Well, tell me about PCP at the levels that Laquan McDonald was tested at. And remember that this is 56 uh, nanograms, I think it's supposed to be. Um, but anyways, this is from the cavity blood. Remember, we heard from the doctor, we heard from uh, Dr. Tease, we heard from the uh, ER doctor. This is from cavity blood. This is after they have already diluted the blood uh, from the treatment. So they said the levels were probably higher than this. But even at this level, assuming that this was the correct level, what can it do? Delusions, behavioral changes, aggressions, violence. Aggressive and violence. The effect of this antipsychotic medication, not taking that. Second line, third line there. And, and PCP, even in a patient without any psychiatric illness or any mental illness, can call severe psychiatric toxicity. He took the psychotropic drug, PCP, fencyclidine, which can cause severe rage, aggression, violent behavior. Well, Jason Van Dyke didn't know that he, upon the down, blood level was 56 nanograms of PCP. Agreed. Agreed. But those symptoms of rage, aggression, violent behavior, drug-induced psychosis, that describes Laquan McDonald. Yeah, Jason Van Dyke recognized it. Did he know it was exactly PCP? Of course not. Did he as a police officer recognize that this guy was whacked out? Absolutely. Did that play a factor in his role to shoot? There's no question. Nick Pappas, slide lock. Remember, he was our training instructor. State makes a big deal. He reloaded. Slide lock. The weapon should be immediately reloaded. That's how they're trained and drilled on that from the very beginning. Knights are more dangerous than guns in certain situations. How quick can somebody cover seven yards, 21 feet, almost double the feet of what we have in the situation that Jason Van Dyke um, encountered with Juan McDonald right before he shot? 1.5 seconds. Yeah, but that's from somebody uh, that is standing still, not from somebody that is already in motion like with Paul McDonald. So that time would have been less, correct. Intent. Again, Yuri Patrick, Jason Van Dyke didn't have any intent to kill this guy, state's witness. Mr. Pappas, police officer's intent in shooting is to eliminate the threat, right? Yes. How about when he's on the ground, Mr. Pappas? Does that mean that he, uh, can he still be considered a, a threat? Certainly can be, yes. Why? Because they could get up and reattack. The saucer Valets, remember she, uh, she was talked about how she thought that Laquan McDonald had the gun and her partner drove away because they were so afraid. She sees Laquan McDonald, he looks deranged, just like Jason saw it. And she points to a, a, a points that I'm making, you know, this is bizarre behavior. We had lights, sirens, he was not looking in our direction. There was not, nothing phasing him. He was like, he was in the twilight. Holding his side, thought he had a gun. Rudy Brillis, the working man, comes home from a long day's work. Uh, little did he know he was going to encounter the burglar, Laquan McDonald. Laquan got in there. We don't know how, but the gate was locked, right? Yes. What'd you see? Another person inside the truck. It's a burglary, ladies and gentlemen. It's a burglary. And that's significant when we get to the peace officer's use of force statute in allowing somebody to use deadly weapon, deadly force. Got out of the truck, asked the person to leave. He didn't. What'd you do? Called the police. Did he continue to advance towards you? 
This is our first sign of the bond being confronted that night. Consistent. Continue to advance towards you. How close did he get? About three feet. What did he do? He pulled out a knife and he wanted to hurt me. What did he do with that knife? He came towards me. He tried to stab me. Remember when he demonstrated? Threw his phone at him. He flees when the police come. The police that night saved Rudy Gorillas. He couldn't talk, he was tongue tied. Remember his testimony about that uh, knife that looks like a, a gun that looks like a knife? Jason Van Dyke, was he thinking that as he was firing his weapon? Probably not, but was it in the back of his mind? He received an training bullet, officer safety bullet. A lot of things in a reasonable police officer's mind. Uh, Miss Alexander, remember she talked about with Juan and his past. Well, Jason didn't know about that. Doesn't matter. You'll get a jury instruction on it. Talks about putting a slug in a judge's head. Dr. Tees, she's clear. Um, cause of death. Gunshot wound, I'm sorry, number four. The state, in their case, they want you to believe that every single bullet, every single shot contributed to the death of Laquan McDonald. It's not true. It's not true. Dr. T's gave it. So what are they going to do to counter that? Bring in the pathologist that just wrote those, uh, a couple of words in there, kind of a cut and paste, uh, pulpification and hemorrhage. Just kind of throw them in after, after description of each shot. They didn't bring that person in. Remember Dr. Rutenmark? Yep, we. Can't find her, she's somewhere in Texas. Why didn't that person come in? Because that's the only, the only evidence that they have that every shot contributed to the death was a couple of words that I argued were cut and paste and put in a report. Why didn't they bring her in? Because she screwed up. And she knew that if she came in to testify, that's what she'd have to say. So can you rely on Dr. Arukamar to rebut Dr. T's? No, Dr. Rukamar is doing nothing more than what the state did and what civilians will do. Read something on a sheet of paper and assume that it's true, despite the evidence to the contrary. No evidence to the contrary. Bleeding from every, um, from every gunshot? Really? Why wasn't there a lot of blood on the scene? They called the... Uh, Shipped Deputy Murphy in yesterday to show there was a lot of blood on the scene. How much was there? Half a cup? Yeah, that sounds about right. Half a cup. If you're bleeding from, from every extremity, there's, there's not going to be more than half a cup. Where was the blood? It was all in here. Why was it all in here? Because he was killed with that first or second shot as he was turned to face Jason Van Dyke with his knife raised ready to attack. The rest Ten of minutes, the, Mr. I'm sorry? Ten minutes. Okay, thank you. The rest of those shots are relevant at that point. Jason Freaks, demonstration. Uh, state makes a big deal about, uh, well, the, the state's own video doesn't show Bob McDonald raising the knife when he turns. So what? Jason Fries was not here to, uh, to do a video game uh, reenactment to show all the movements of Laquan McDonald. He was here to show the distance between Laquan McDonald and Jason Van Dyke. If we, if we had him put in all these things, it, he said, I think the conservative approach. My analysis is to show the distances. And if you look at that distance, I think it gives a better perspective, but still not Jason Van Dyke's. Scott Patterson, he talks about, um, he's got, shoots 80,000 rounds a, a year, I think he said. Um, when I asked him, do you ever shoot on the, on the range, you just empty your gun, shoot all 16 rounds? Oh yeah. Do you have the intent to fire each one of those rounds? No, no, you just fire. You empty the gun. Barry Brown, what's your opinion? The problem was just
finishing up here, ladies and gentlemen. All of those factors that I've just discussed, as I said, each and every one of them individually is reasonable doubt. Did the state prove its case? Not even close. But we've just been talking about the um, Jason Van Dyke's being in reasonable fear for his life, and that's when he fired. That's what we've been talking about. But remember when I told you in opening, and I showed you the same slide that I'm going to show you right now. I told you that there's a statute out here, look at this jury instruction, and it talks about situations in which police officers can use deadly force even when it has nothing to do with protecting themselves or somebody else. And I told you in the opening, I'm like, I don't know what the state's going to argue, but there's no evidence to rebut, to dispute what we're showing here. Remember we had Ms. Sayre from the police academy talk about this? Peace officer need not retreat or desist from efforts to make a lawful arrest because of resistance. He's justified in using force likely to cause death or great body of harm. That's an offensive life. Portion. Or, 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 even if you're not afraid for your life or somebody else's life, here's where it differs between us, a regular citizen, and a police officer. They're allowed to use deadly force to prevent the arrest from being defeated by resistance or escape, and the person to be arrested has committed or attempted a forcible felony which involves the infliction or threatened infliction of great bodily harm. He certainly threatened to kill Rudy Barillas, didn't he? He certainly threatened Officer Gaffney in that vehicle. Right there alone, he can shoot Jason Van Dyke. Or, even if, even if you couldn't, you didn't think he met that category. The person to be arrested is attempting to escape by use of a deadly weapon. Was Jason Van Dyke trying to escape by use of a deadly weapon? But for this weapon, he dropped it, he would have been on arrest. The weapon was the only thing that prevented the police from arresting Jason Van Dyke. The point of balance, excuse me. Or, even if you don't buy that one, this individual indicates that he will endanger human life or inflict great bodily harm unless arrested without delay. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing here, thank you for the additional time, Judge. In, in closing here, ladies and gentlemen, Oh, do I? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the police saved Rudy Brillis that night. They saved him because when they arrived, that scooted, skirted Laquan McDonald off. Police are here to serve and protect. Remember I showed you the squad car video. They can't retreat. They can't run away like us. And they have to encounter people that create their own destiny. I told you, Bob McDonald was the author, the choreographer of this story. And Jason Van Dyke had to be brought into it. So I'm going to ask you, when you go back to the jury room and you start deliberating with your uh, fellow jurors, Remember that, you know, sometimes the, the right decision is not always the easiest decision. But you, you owe it to yourself to make the right decision here. Because nobody can fault you for making the right decision. You follow your heart, you follow your soul, you follow your mind. You also owe it to Jason Van Dyke. He chose you. He chose you. He's putting his fate in your hands. We also owe it to our, to our city, our county, our country. You have a very important job here. It's a critical task. I'm going to 
ask you to follow your hearts, follow your minds, and do what you're required to do here, which is to base your decision based upon the evidence. This is, a, this is a grassroots case where we're going back to the jurors to decide this because the people can decide, not looking through rose colored glasses, not looking based upon motivation for uh, politics. It's you, the citizens. Give Jason Van Dyke the benefit. He's innocent right now until you go in that room and say he's guilty. And the only way you can do that is based on the evidence. And if you review the evidence fair and partially, I think there's really only uh, one decision you can make, and that's not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Earl. Hey, if you like that video, be sure to subscribe to our ABC7 Chicago YouTube channel.